Good morning, and happy Father's Day. Father's Day, like Mother's Day, can be kind of tough, because sometimes our father may not be around. Sometimes we may not have had the father we wanted. Sometimes we might not be the father we want to be. And sometimes we think, I hope, I don't know, are we working here, John? My green light is on. Isn't technology fun? But one thing we should always remember on Father's Day, especially when we call God our Father, is that calling God our Father doesn't mean that God is like a human father. What it means is that every human father The Strawberry Social, although I was not able to make it, I'm told went very well. The Picnic, which many people worked really hard on, was a fantastic success. I believe we'll be doing that event again. We had people from the community, many people from the community. I think there were probably about 200 people who came to have hot dogs and listen to great music. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. It begins one week from today. It begins at 5.30, and there will be dinner served, and it's open to the entire community for people kindergarten through grade five. Are there any other announcements anyone would like to share? Let's worship God. morning. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Holy triune God, you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. You are our guide, our comfort, and our peace. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and truth in this hour, and grant us grace to live each day with love, obedience, and gratitude. Amen.
with our call to confession and assurance of pardon come to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace we have been saved. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Loving God, righteous judge, we confess that we sin by arrogantly presuming to take your position as judge and then judging unjustly. In addition, we commit the double sin of ignoring your standards and imposing our own standards on other people as if we had the right to define wrong and right. We allow differences of opinion and personal preferences to inhibit the love and community you desire. We take offense at things we should simply let slide. Furthermore, we are slow to see our own sins and shortcomings, but quick to point out the sins and shortcomings of other people. Sometimes we take sinful, perverse pleasure in fault-finding, nitpicking, and gossiping. Lord, please impress upon us how much each of these sins offends you, how much they hurt us, how much they hurt others, and how much they sabotage both our witness and Christ's ongoing work. Excise self-righteousness and judgmental attitudes from our hearts. Fill us afresh with your own kind of welcoming, forgiving, self-giving love. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, our Judge, Lord, and Savior. Amen. By grace we have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing, it is the gift of God. In Jesus we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Yep, I should be, yep. Okay, come on up here. You have to sit down, sweetheart. You come sit beside me. This is... Okay. Now there's three of us. Sometimes you gotta bring your own, you know, folks along. So I'm glad you're here. That is Karison. That is my granddaughter. Yes, she is a little on the pretty side. <laughs> and this is Jay. You know Jay. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. What I want to talk to you about today is the heart, not the one ticking inside your body, but your heart. 
the person that loves and cares, the person who, when nobody else is watching, you're still kind to one another. Okay, isn't that a pretty good idea? Yeah, it's tough sometimes, but God looks on our heart, okay? God cares about us, how we treat others. God sees us. He sees the hidden potential. Now, potential is kind of a big word. It describes something or someone that has abilities to be certain, a certain kind of person. And we want to be a certain kind of person. We want to be a loving person, a caring person, a person that pays attention when their granddad's talking. <laughs> he comes by that very naturally, okay? So um, for all of us, we have hidden talents. And you know what God does? He brings out our innocent hidden talents. I've seen your hidden talents many times. You are a loving, caring person. And that is a talent that not everybody has. Okay? She reads at a sixth grade level. That's a talent. Jay and I, we're good folk. We like to be nice to people. Uh, most of the time. And uh, there are all kinds of hidden talents that we have. But how we treat others when no one else is looking but perhaps God. Okay? So we treat people the way we want to be treated with love and respect. Let's pray before I talk too long. Dear Lord, I just praise you and thank you for these children, for these children are your children, Lord, and you care for them. You see the potential in them, Lord, what their future will look like. All they need to do is trust in you, and everything should fall into place. I pray that you'd bless them and keep them in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can go back with your uncles and your dad and you can go back with your mommy I see her over there you do know your mommy and I went to college together <laughs> I only tell you that every week <laughs>
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God of love, grace, and justice, nourish us by our word. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and help us to grow in faith and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And the scripture I have here is from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Today, I brought something that I really cherish. It's a sign, and I'm gonna walk out and let you see it, and hopefully Lou can focus on it. But if you don't get a chance to see, if I don't get close enough to you, it says, don't judge someone just because they sin differently than you. That's worth remembering. Don't judge someone just because they sin differently than you. Of course, the implication is we all sin. You know, it's great to throw rocks if you don't live in a glass house. It's fine to call the kettle black if you're not a kettle yourself. It's great to, using a biblical metaphor, remove the log out of someone else's eye. Or, I'm sorry, to remove the speck out of someone else's eye. But before we can remove the speck from someone else's eyes, we have to get the logs out of our own eyes. In other words, if there's judging to be done, it ought to be done by perfect people, and that's not me or you. 
So don't judge someone just because they sin differently than you. Isn't that awesome? My mom had this on a bookshelf and I was just blown away by it. I liked it so much. And she gave it to me. And now it lives in my office and I cherish it. And the reason I'm sharing this today is that it really fits with what we're talking about today in 1 Samuel chapter 7, where, sorry, or sorry, chapter 16, verse 7, where we read that God does not look at what people look at. God looks at the heart. All right, without further ado, let's listen to our passage for today, 1 Samuel chapter 16, the, 13, the first 13 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When Samuel arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Jesse answered, they're still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So Jesse sent for his youngest son and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise, anoint him, this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then returned to Ramah. I should probably say at the outset that that talk about rejecting and choosing pertains to kingship. It doesn't pertain to salvation. I'm not saying that God doesn't elect people to salvation, but that passage isn't talking about that. The people who are chosen and the people who are rejected has to do with just the office of king in that passage. Because King Saul the first king, 
the king we learned about two weeks ago. No, it was last week, 1 Samuel 8, the king that the people chose. He did some really bad things that we're not talking about this year because the lectionary skips over those passages. But Saul, to put it simply, displayed a pattern of disobedience and a refusal to repent and change his ways. And for those reasons, God rejected Saul as king. Samuel, in today's passage, is mourning Saul, mourning for Saul. Samuel certainly was saddened by Saul's behavior. Samuel probably was mourning for Saul because Samuel had invested himself in Saul for decades. And Samuel cared about Saul. And I'm pretty sure that Samuel's mourning over Saul also included concerns about what the failures of Saul as king would mean for the future of Israel as a nation. With no king, there was a vacuum of power. With no king, there was no one to lead Israel's armies. With no king, things would quickly degenerate. But as is always the case, thank God, as is always the case, God had a plan to provide for his people. God had already picked the new king, young David. And yes, it would be years before Saul was finally out of the picture and David ascended to the throne. But in today's passage, David is anointed as king and he receives an indwelling of the Holy Spirit that would lead him all of his life. God asked Samuel how long Samuel was going to mourn over Saul. Then God gave Samuel a job to do. God sent Samuel to anoint the new king. There's a lesson here. Grief is a normal part of life. And Christians do grieve. We just grieve differently. As Paul says, I do not want you to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Christians grieve as people who trust in Jesus. People who trust that Jesus died for them, rose for them, and that he says to every believer on the day they die, truly I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Christians grieve, but we grieve knowing that death on earth is not the end of life because we know that we will spend eternity with God and with all of God's grace-saved people. When Christians grieve, God's promises give us comfort. And yet, even for Christians, grief can last a long time. Today's passage suggests one helpful way for, de for dealing with grief. And that helpful way of dealing with grief is to get busy, to busy ourselves doing things that God wants us to do. We see that right clearly in the passage. Samuel was grieving. God gave him a job and told him to get busy. And getting busy lifted Samuel's spirit. Being active, especially being active, doing God's business can help us with our grief. Next point, verse two. Samuel says to God, how can I go? And the words to Bethlehem are not there. We have to supply him from the earlier verse. But how can I go to Bethlehem? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Why is that? Well, the previous time when Samuel had seen Saul, 
Samuel delivered a God-given message of judgment. Samuel had the unpleasant job of standing before the king and saying, God has rejected you as king, and you will lose your throne to another. Because Samuel had basically read Saul his notice that he was going to be dethroned, there was a very real possibility that Saul would attack Samuel if their paths crossed. And even worse, if Saul correctly figured out that Samuel was going to anoint a new king to replace Saul, well, then Samuel's life was certainly in danger. Chances are very, very good, very, very good, that God will never send you or me to anoint the next king. But you know what? God does send us to act as messengers for God. And being a messenger for God, as we see in this passage and many, many more, being a messenger for God sometimes puts us in uncomfortable or even dangerous situations. Of course, that's true for pastors. God sometimes gives pastors messages that the congregations don't want to hear. But... It's true for every Christian. If you are a Christian, then you are a messenger for God. If you are a Christian, then God has commanded you to share the love and the truth of Jesus. Now, when you go sharing the love of Jesus, most people will accept that. But when you try to share the truth about Jesus, oh boy, you'll encounter some rejection. You'll encounter some hatred. You may even encounter some violence toward yourself. Sharing the truth and the love of Jesus can put us in difficult situations. And in such situations, we need to ask ourselves a very simple question Whom do we want to please? Do we want to please people or do we want to please the Lord? Now, please turn with me to the heart, pun intended, of the passage, verses 6 and 7. Please listen to those verses again. When they arrived, meaning Jesse and his family, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In the Bible, heart almost never refers to a blood-pumping muscle. In the Bible, heart refers to what we would call mind and what we would call will or determination. And as in modern English, sometimes heart refers to emotions. In the Bible, Heart refers to our inner self, that part that's most, that is truly us. Heart is our inner self, the part that thinks, desires, makes plans, and seeks to fulfill those plans. Humans can never see another person's heart. In fact, we have a lot of trouble even seeing our own heart. The best we can do is to look at the fruit in a person's life. What's the effect they have on others? 
What kind of character? Fruit often means character in Scripture. What fruit is in their life? Do we see any of the characteristics of Jesus in a person? When we look at a person and their actions, do we see those classic nine fruit of the Spirit? Do we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? We can't see a person's heart, but we can see some of their fruit. But please understand, even when we are observing and considering the fruit in someone's life, any decision we make about another person must be held tentatively and in humility because fruit takes time to grow. A person who seems to completely lack spiritual fruit right now could blossom beautifully in the future. God looks at people's hearts, but you can't. I can't. And that means that we are wise to leave the judging to the only one who can see what's really inside a person. Now, some of you might be thinking, it's kind of weird that verse 7 says that God doesn't look at, at appearances, God looks at the heart, but then the passage goes right on to state that David was a good-looking young man. The point there is that good looks are not harmful. Good looks do not disqualify a person from God's service, but they're not at all essential. It doesn't matter whether we look good or bad on the outside. What matters is how we look to God on the inside. People tend to look at the wrong things. And after looking at the wrong things, we tend to form wrong opinions. And then we act on our wrong opinions, or we share our wrong opinions, and we end up hurting people. Some people arrogantly believe that they can understand what goes on in the heads and hearts of other people. Maybe you think that you can understand what's going on in someone else's head or heart. But the truth is this. We never know for sure what another person's motives are. We never know for sure why people do what they do. Sometimes we don't even know why we do what we do. Raise your hand if you've ever had the experience of doing something and then saying, I, thinking to yourself, I don't know why I did that. Well, if you've ever done something and been like, I don't know why I did that, that was dumb. Well, if you ever have had that experience, you're in great company, the company of no less than the Apostle Paul. Corey, thank you for handing me the Bible. This thought came to me while I was listening to Nat's beautiful music. And I was reaching behind me for a Bible, and Corey figured it out, and he handed it to me. So this comes from Romans chapter 7. Paul says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. I agree that the law is good, so then, it is no, so then it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will to do what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want to do, that is what I do. Now, of course, the answer to that, this is not a sermon on Romans 7 and 8, but the answer to that problem is to live in the Holy Spirit. Romans 7 is about people living in the power of the flesh. 
And when we live in the power of the flesh, our life is doo-doo. Meaning we do the things we don't want to do and we don't do the things we do want to do. But when we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we are able to do the good things that we want to do. And we're able to stop doing the things that we don't want to do. Sometimes, like Paul, we don't even know why we do what we do. So let's not think we understand why other people do what they do, because we don't. One of the dumbest things in the English language, and I don't know if this is true in other languages, but it certainly is true in ours. We sometimes say, if I were you, or if I were him, or if I were her, my friends, no matter what comes next out of your mouth, it's a dumb statement. Because we're not you, we're not him, we're not her, we're us. Every person is a unique human being created by God. Every person on planet Earth who's ever been and ever will be is as unique as our thumbprints, as unique as a snowflake. Every person not only is created unique, we are all shaped by unique, unique sets of circumstances and experiences. Consequently, you and I never, ever are in a position to understand completely why anyone does what they do. So let's never say, if I were you, because we aren't. Remember, even we sometimes don't know why we do what we do. We certainly can't know why somebody else does what they do. It is an arrogant and exceedingly vile sin to judge another person based on our personal standards. What I mean is it is an arrogant and exceedingly vile sin for us to take our personal preferences and use them to judge other people. For example, we might say, oh, he should have waited longer or she shouldn't wear that. Or he should cut his hair. That's very different from taking the Bible and saying, he should not commit adultery. She should not commit murder. Do you see the difference there? One is God's law, and the other is our personal preferences. When we impose our personal preferences upon other people. We are committing an exceedingly vile sin because we are putting ourselves in the place of God. That is the worst form of idolatry. And God takes idolatry very seriously. Imposing our personal standards on other people is the worst form of idolatry because when we place our personal standards on other people, we're putting ourselves in the place of God. Only God has the right to set universal standards. Only God has the right to define what is wrong and what is right. Only God has the right to demand that people do things his way. And yet so often we don't. When you feel tempted, and by the way, I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to me. When you feel tempted to judge another person, let's keep in mind these words from Romans chapter 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servant stand or fall. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all 
stand before the judgment seat of God. That's obviously a rhetorical question there in Romans 10.4. Who are you to judge somebody else's servant? The answer, of course, is I'm nobody to judge someone else's servant. And we're all servants of God. That's what it, Paul is getting at. Because God looks at the heart, you and I are wise to heed the words of Proverbs 4.23, which say, above all else, Above all else, guard your hearts, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Jesus puts it this way. He says, a good person brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil person brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I suppose that in addition to looking at fruit, to get an idea of what kind of person a person is. And we never get to judge someone in terms of whether or not they're saved or not. But we do have to make value judgments. We do have to ask ourselves, is this the kind of person I want to be my friend? Is this the kind of person I want to spend time with? Is this the kind of person I want to vote for? Is this the kind of person who I want to get advice from? We look at the fruit of a person's life to do that, and we remember what Jesus says, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. We cannot see into another person's heart, but the words that a person says give us some clues about what's inside there. Remember, in the Bible, the word heart includes what we would call mind, and in the Bible, the word heart includes what we would call will or determination. It includes emotions. In the Bible, heart means the inner self, the part of us that thinks, desires, and makes plans. And the Bible warns us, saying, above all else, guard your hearts, for everything you do flows flows from your hearts. Now that begs the question, how exactly do we guard our hearts? Well, one of the ways we guide our hearts is to hide God's word in them. That's not my idea. It comes from Psalm 119. David says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that goes right along with the idea of we guard our hearts by being careful about what we let get into them. We guard our hearts by being careful about what we let enter our minds. We guard our hearts by being careful about what we look at, careful about what we watch, careful about what we listen to. We guard our hearts by being careful about the thoughts that we allow ourselves to entertain. Now, don't get me wrong. We cannot control what thoughts enter our heads. Every single one of us, I'm sure, has had the experience multiple times of having thoughts just come, out, come, out, come into our heads and we don't know where that came from. Sometimes thoughts like that come from God. Sometimes... They come from the enemy. Sometimes God only knows where they come from. We cannot control what thoughts come into our minds, but brothers and sisters, we can control what thoughts we give our attention to. We 
when we have a thought come into our mind that we know is not appropriate, we can't just try and push that thought out and say, I'm not going to think about anything because vacuums always get filled. The way that we control what thoughts stay in our head is by choosing what to focus on. If we're thinking thought A, thought A comes into our head, we know thought A is bad, we simply turn our attention to thought B. And one of the best thought Bs, one of the best things to get thoughts out of our head is to start thinking about a verse or two of scripture that we've memorized. Another way that we can guard our hearts is to pray like David did in Psalm 51, where he says, create in me. A clean heart, O oh God. Create in me a clean heart and restore a right spirit within me. David also prayed in Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. You and I can and should ask God to show us the things that we need to weed out and remove from our hearts. And we can and should ask God to help us do that removing. And another thing we can do to guard our hearts is we can feed them a healthy diet. We can feed our hearts a healthy diet by feeding them scripture, by feeding them worship, of course, on Sundays together, but also on Monday through Saturday alone or at home with our families. And we can feed our hearts by turning our attention frequently to God throughout each day. There's one more thing I feel today's passage really wants to say to us. God's choice of young David to be king is one of many, many passages that remind us that our God is a God of surprises. Our God is a God of surprises. Put another way, things are often different from what they seem to be. What seems to be an obstacle often turns out to be a door. And we see this in hindsight. But when we look back on our lives and we see what God has done in our lives in the past, seeing God's activity in our past helps us to trust God in the present and for the future. I can think of many times where it seemed like God had placed a wall right in front of my face. And then as I tearfully go along the wall trying to find some light, bam, there's a tunnel into something wonderful. What often looks like an obstacle is often a door to opportunity. What looks like defeat is often a step toward victory. What looks like the end is often a new beginning. And what looks like a problem often turns out to be a blessing. Our God is a God of surprises. In Isaiah 58, God says words that we should all take to heart. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Because God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and because God's ways are not our ways, you and I need guidance from God. We need guidance from God, not just with our big decisions. We need guidance from God with the small parts of life. And that brings us to the passage that Aidan shared with us today. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to God, and he will make your path straight. Some translations say, in all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will make your path straight. The word there in the Hebrew is yada, which just means to know. But know, K-N-O-W, is a very big word in Hebrew. 
It means a lot of different things. For example, we read that Adam knew Eve and they bore a son. No is a big word in Hebrew. And to know how to translate the word no, K-N-O-W, is always take an act of interpretation. But while in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight, that's certainly reasonable linguistically. But what's it mean to acknowledge God? Oh, hey, you know, and go about your business. I really think the NIV gets to the heart of the verse when it says, submit to the Lord. So one more time, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that is a command. It's an invitation, and it's a promise. Please pray with me. Great and gracious God, judge of the universe, grant us wisdom. Grant us patience. Grant us perspective. Grant us guidance. Live and rule in us, Lord Jesus. And help us to live in ways that are pleasing in your sight. Help us to be a friend to the friendless. Help us to be a source of blessing to those in need. And Lord, because some needs are infinitely greater than our ability to meet, we ask you to pour out grace upon every creature according to their needs for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name, praying as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. whom all blessings flow.
join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Gracious God, all that we have comes from you. We want to be faithful stewards of all you have entrusted to us. Please lead us in living and in giving. Help us to be faithful disciples and faithful caretakers of your property. Amen. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forever. Amen. <laughs> 